Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Catherine Keener. Um, and I work for a freelance company uh, run by myself, I'm self employed, um, which is called CMS Archaeology. So let's get this started. So, CMS Archaeology, um, and what I'm going to try and talk about today sort of goes in three parts really. Uh, part number one, uh, I'll have a talk through what you actually have to do, what's involved, what you need to consider in terms of setting up as self employed. And hopefully that can give you an idea of what's involved and you can see if it's something that could be of interest to you now or in the future. Um, there'll be a lot of nitty gritty information, but we'll try and get out of the way at the start in part one about finances, tax returns, uh, national insurance, and sort of how to go about doing self assessments. So that's the kind of the detailed stuff. And I'm sort of going into a reasonable amount of detail on that because I think that's what a lot of people maybe find quite daunting about the idea of setting up as self employed initially. Um, and it can be quite straightforward, and hopefully after the talk today you'll have a good idea of what's involved and whether it's something you want to commit to. Um, so I'll probably have a toilet break partway through, just because it's going to be quite a lot of information all at once. Um, so a little break partway through, and then we'll maybe go into a bit more detail, the kind of general concepts of how you run your business, uh, depending on what type of interests you have. And then we'll sort of wrap it up with a bit of question and answer. If you've got anything you need to ask to clarify, um, or you want my opinion on, then I'll be around. And we'll also have a look at some of the useful resources out there that you can go in and take a look at. And um, hopefully have a bit more interaction in that last session as well, in terms of sort of checking what it is you've learned so far, if there's anything from that that prompts further questions, and having a think about um, your potential future business if it's something you're interested in looking at. So there's lots of different terminology that gets thrown around. Um, sole trader, self-employed, freelance, these all mean basically the same thing. Um, it's the, the sort of tricky thing about self-employment that there is no legal definition as such. Um, so there's, there's lots of different definitions out there on the web, um, but how I would define it um, to be as clear as possible is when you're basically dealing with your own tax. You get paid a lump of money for work and you then have to basically declare that you're self-employed and you have to then address how much tax you owe, how much national insurance you owe. Um, and then you pay that to the government at certain points through the year. Other sorts of definitions, it's when you're working for yourself, you're choosing which projects to take on, choosing who you work for, and to some extent as well, probably choosing what hours you work uh, within the project. You've got to deal with your own tax, as I've said, and you're also going to be sort of having a, some sort of level of control over the sorts of disciplines or the sorts of specialisms that you're getting into. It's very different from setting up a company limited by guarantee. That's a much more complex process. It involves having a board of directors or a board of trustees and quite a lot more sort of legal situation to kind of get into. And it's different as well from what I imagine most people in this room are doing, which is working on a pay AYE basis, pay as you earn basis. Um, whether that's a permanent contract, full time, part time, a zero hour contract, um, or agency staff. So, I think what I'll do just to kind of give you an idea where I'm coming from, my experience of being self-employed, is give you an idea um, where I've worked over the years and, and what sort of basis that's been on. I started off as a student at the University of Glasgow where I did my undergrad and postgrad degrees and during that time I worked on a variety of different research projects um, on a sort of atypical worker basis. Um, so that was a good way for me to start to get into the, the sort of industry and to gain experience. When I left university, I worked at the Royal Commission on Nation Historic Monuments for a while, initially as part of a work placement, and then later just continued on the projects I've been working on for a couple of months. So that was about six months' work, um, and again, that was on a PAYE sort of basis. Um, I then got a full-time job with Arch, which is a company based up in Dingwall in the Highlands of Scotland, and it was a, basically a project officer job working in community archaeology. It was mainly on HLF and leader-funded projects, and it was a lot of different variety in terms of excavation projects, and training, evening classes, all with a community basis about getting people out in the community to come in and engage with, with archaeology, as I think most of you have probably been doing during the last year. While I was doing this, I started to realise that there were other bits of archaeology that I wasn't really getting to, to grips with in terms of the job I was doing. I enjoyed doing the survey work, and I enjoyed doing lots of different illustration and GIS work, and so it made sense to me to start doing small term contracts over weekends or in holiday time and then later when the job stopped being full time I just started to ramp up the freelance work. So that was the sort of point where I decided it was worth becoming self-employed 
I had a job that sort of gave me some stability and a good wage, and I could then start to look into developing freelance stuff, which gave me a little bit more choice over what I was doing. About two, two years ago, just over two years ago, I went uh, freelance on a kind of full-time basis. Um, I also work sometimes for Northlight Heritage, who are a company based up in Glasgow. They're the sort of Scottish arm of York Archaeological Trust. And I work for them on a zero-hour contract basis, so there's no commitment from them to give me work, no commitment for me to take work if they have it. Um, but I find the combination worked quite well in terms of I basically work freelance, and then if I don't have any work or an interesting projects coming up, I have the option to then opt to work for Northway Heritage on certain projects. That was very good because it gave me a level of stability if the freelance stuff wasn't um, keeping me going. And it also gives me the option to go and do stuff I maybe wouldn't want to charge for on a freelance basis, things that involve bigger resources. Um, and it gives me the chance to gain new skills as well. I can move into different types of projects with the support of other staff around me. Um, and then later that sort of information, that experience can then be applied to freelance work potentially. Um, so in my freelance work, I work for a variety of different people, different clients and organisations. Um, Universities, Glasgow, Chester and Aberdeen, um, mainly on research-based projects. Um, national organisations like Historic Scotland, National Trust for Scotland, um, on a sort of project basis, depending on what work they have. Um, some community projects, um, which are generally either in heritage lottery funded, but I would be contracted by the holder of the grant, so the, the community group, the historical group, um, to do a certain piece of work, whether it's a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. I also work um, on a sort of subcontracted basis for other small archaeological units in Scotland. Um, some examples, OJT Heritage is um, Dr Ollie O'Grady, he's based out of Perthshire and he's a geophysicist. And he, that's his specialism, but he also needs um, people to come in and do topographic surveys, to do excavation work, things like that. So I sometimes work for him on that basis. And similarly for Ralston Property Archaeology Services, they're based up in the Highlands on the Black Isle and they have all sorts of different work, commercial work, research, community-based projects, and so sometimes I work for them depending on uh, their staffing sort of needs. So, lots of different organisations, and those are the ones that I've put up that are of particular interest. There are also a few commercial clients, and um, for data confidentiality, I tend not to mention those because you have to kind of keep the details very close. Um, but, this is the sort of majority of the stuff I like to work on if I get the option. So the commercial stuff for me is something that takes a back seat the minute there's something more research-based or community-based around to do. Um, in terms of the sorts of work I'm doing for these people, um, it's a real variety. I don't like to put in a box, like I only do excavation, I only do community work, I only do illustrations. So I try and keep the variety going and I think that helps in terms of a freelance lifestyle. The more skills you have, the more likely you are to get work coming in from different locations. So lots of different things, workshops and training, uh, whether that's for communities, for students, for other professionals. Uh, GIS and database management is something that I'm sort of particularly interested in, that's what I did my postgraduate work on. Uh, all sorts of field work, whether it's surveys, excavation, and then stuff that you can do in the office as well, um, illustration work that comes in from the GIS-based stuff, and uh, aerial photography analysis, again, is something that I've done a bit of work with, mainly through the Royal Commission. Um, and again, I do do commercial contracts, like watching briefs, evaluations, um, control stripping, um, things like that. So, again, I try and keep that sort of link to when I need to do it, because it tends to be less interesting, um, sort of, well, where I work in the Highlands quite often, it's just watching a digger for a week and there's no archaeology. So if I can avoid it, I do, but um, it's useful work and it's regular work if it's the kind of thing you're interested in doing. Um, in terms of the sorts of people that I come across doing this, I'm speaking mainly in Scotland because that's my area of experience. Um, people like Ollie, who are particular specialists in their field, he's got a research interest in the medieval period, and he's got a survey specialism in, in geophysics. So he combines those two wherever he can, and that's the sort of contracts he looks for, the stuff he'll tender for, and the stuff that he prefers to work on. Um, Ross and Property are a bit more of a sort of um, jack of all trades sort of group, a bit more like myself. There's two, two individuals involved, Lynn Fraser and uh, Mary Peterana, and the two of them have quite a, a wide skill set and wide interest between them. So they work on all sorts of commercial work, 
research projects and they have a real sort of like enjoyment I think in terms of taking projects from start to finish so they need that skill set to take a project from start to finish and subcontract in specialists where they need to or where they don't have the skills themselves. Um, I think I've noticed a predominance in freelance and self-employed archaeologists in rural areas where there's not really the work uh, the level of work that would sustain a large commercial company um, so that's where there's a kind of a scope for small projects that an individual based in the area can actually go out and do the job they're more likely to get employed than bringing in someone from outside uh, which might involve travel costs and generally being a bit, a bit more expensive having that sort of knowledge of a particular region as well can be very useful um, in terms of being able to understand the sort of the ins and outs and the intricacies of your local archaeology Again, that's a kind of a benefit, so it's where self-employed people can really kind of make a huge um, sort of impact in terms of getting work and also being able to say that is their specialism. It doesn't have to be a skill, it can be knowledge of an area. And things like fine specialists, illustrators, surveyors, that seems to be the sorts of um, specialisms that people have as well when they're self-employed. Um, things that you're, there's enough work coming through and that you can be sort of employed enough to earn a living, but also um, a very specific specialism and a skill set that maybe you, you, not everyone has. So lots of different ways to kind of take advantage of being self-employed, whether it's local knowledge, a specific specialism, or just um, wanting to be involved in projects right from the beginning to the end. So with anything, there's lots of pros and cons. I'll go through the pros first as I see them anyway. For me, flexibility is a huge thing. I can choose when I can work, and I can take on projects at certain times of the year that suit me better. So, for example, if I don't want to be outside in snow blizzards during the winter, I can try and look for work that's indoors. It doesn't always work, but you can, um, you can attempt to kind of guide what, what you do and when you do it. Um, in terms of pay, generally the freelance work I've done is generally better paid than uh, other work I've done. Um, you have the element of choice, so you can direct which way your career goes in terms of what sort of work you take on, assuming that there's lots of work happening. Um, the variety for me is really important. I don't like to do just one thing, I like to do a bit of everything, so that's the kind of thing that you really take advantage of in self-employed work. Um, you get to go to a lot of cool places if you're willing to travel, um, and you do get to see all stages of a project through if that's what you're interested in. Um, and it means you get to explore things at quite a superficial level sometimes, like I don't have a particular fine specialism or post-excavation specialism, but I know enough about each thing to know how to direct um, direct work on a post-excavation strategy. Um, and so even though I don't necessarily want to go off and do a PhD on flints, I get to go and learn a little bit about flints enough to know what to happen when I find them on site and how I can deal with that best, which specialist to speak to as well. There are cons. I was trying to make the lists nice and balanced so that there was the same number of pros and cons, but there are probably more cons to freelance work, and I don't think that's something that should be covered up, really. Um, consistency of work, major issue. If there's not much work happening, not much things coming up, or if you're quite picky, then you might not get work that goes all the way through the year. Um, regular wages, delayed invoices, you can get stuck in, particularly if you're being subcontracted by other people, you can get stuck waiting for money for quite a while. If one invoice is delayed right at the start, by the time you're being paid, it could be months after you've done the work. Um, so it's something that you need to try and have some sort of buffer financially. And I'll go into the kind of financial side of it later. Um, but it is a definite problem in, in terms of cash flow. Um, you might have to travel a lot. I don't mind travelling um, on the scale I travel at the moment. I go up and down from Glasgow to Reness, which is about a three and a half hour car journey. I go up and down probably on average once every fortnight but it'll happen over a month, I'll be going up and down twice a week, and then a month I'll be in Glasgow, or a month I'll be in Inverness. And that's just partly because I've chosen to take jobs across the country rather than um, staying in one place. So it's not a necessity, it's something you can choose to do, but if you're willing to travel, you're probably more likely to get a variety of work and get onto quite interesting projects. Um, you get busy in quiet periods. Um, March has been incredibly busy for me, it's end of financial year, lots of people coming to me and saying, oh, there's a small bit of money left here, could we go and do something with that? Um, so you, you'll find that you'll be very, very busy for a month and then the following month might be very quiet, which if you've been busy is fine, it's a relief, but if you're quiet for quite a long time, then you have to start thinking about developing things for the future. 
Sustainability, I think, is a big one. I know a lot of people who've been self-employed for a while, they've enjoyed it, but inevitably they decide to get a permanent job somewhere if something comes up. So it's something that you might want to consider doing for a short space of time as a bridge and then go into another sort of job later on, perhaps with a bit more experience on your belt. Um, for me, at the moment, I plan to be freelance as long as I can make it work. Um, I have no real plans to take on a job in one place, uh, but I'm sure at some point I'll probably th start thinking about settling down or having a more regular income. Um, but it's a major issue. If I'm sort of thinking about being freelance for the next 30, 40 years, how am I going to sustain that? I need to be putting money away into a pension scheme, I need savings, and with the sort of combination of that and the consistency of work and delayed invoices, it's not an easy thing to do. It's something you definitely have to think about balancing uh, as much as possible. And if you want to develop your own projects or if you want to tender for projects and it takes quite a lot of time to put your tender together, a lot of that work time is going unpaid. And again, that's something that you can look at in terms of finances and how much you're charging. You can offset that slightly, but inevitably you will be doing work um, for free in terms of setting up projects. So if you're thinking about going freelance, um, I think you don't probably want to dive straight in unless you have a big contract set up already. It's probably a good idea in most cases to start off um, just doing bits and pieces here and there with another job in, in the wings that's bringing in more regular money. Now that's all well and good to say that, that you need the job in the first place to give that flexibility, but if you have that option it's a real luxury to have a job and to then be able to set up slowly and start to get things in place and then make a kind of decision to move more strongly into the freelance market. Um, as time goes on and once you're in a stable position to do so. Um, if you do have a job in the background, whether it's a zero or a contract job where you can pick up bits and pieces of work, or whether it's a part-time contract, um, this all improves some of the cons of freelance work. You've got more consistency of work, you can fill in gaps in freelance work with zero or contract work, um, you, you might have more regular wages coming in from one job, so at least you can guarantee cash flow, and it sort of helps again with sustainability. So I think what's really important, if you're going to go freelance, it is a lot of work, um, a lot of time invested in it, and so it's important to have a think about why you're going freelance and what benefits you're going to get um, before sort of making that, that leap. It also helps, the more structured you're thinking beforehand, the more structured the product's going to be once you actually go freelance. So I think it's really important to have a think about what we actually like doing. Um, most archaeologists I know do archaeology because they like it, um, rather than for um, career options or amazing wages or anything like that. So you have to have a think, what do I really like doing and is there a way to actually incorporate that in, into this plan to go freelance? What sort of time are you going to be doing freelance work? Is it going to be a couple of weekend events every now and then? Is it going to be something you're aiming to bring in all your wages from or somewhere in between? Because um, that'll have a major implication in terms of how much setup you're going to need and how much you're going to have to invest in it. What do you actually need to start? What sort of work are you doing? Is it stuff you need particular equipment for? Do you need to know um, particular sort of legal situations if it's more commercial work? And is all of this together something that you think is feasible, whether it's now or something to start planning for, saving for, and uh, structuring for the future? So, in terms of the finances, that's probably the major stumbling block, I would say, and uh, the major thing to consider maybe is a more possible way of doing it. Um, once you've decided to go freelance, you need to have some startup money. That might be £100 because you need some stationery, it might be a couple of thousand pounds or more. It totally depends what you're interested in doing, what your plans are. Um, in terms of what you need, you need insurance and you probably need some level of equipment. You may or may not need office space, you might be able to hot desk in someone else's office, you might be able to work from home. Um, marketing, if you don't have many contacts in the industry, you might need to start having to think about how you get your name out there, how you start to pull work in. And again, that can be really important in terms of that development time issue that I was talking about. The more people that approach you with work, the less development time you need to spend going out searching for it. And that's something that will probably inevitably start off quite slow, and then the more people you get to know, the more work you do, the more your name gets out there, and the better things are. And then also, what sort of expenses are you going to be incurring? Are you going to have the cash flow to cover those, or are you going to need to have a think about how you're charging um, clients for things? 
Um, I think, as I said, starting small and then building up the resources is the way to go. Have a think about what's the absolute minimum you need in terms of resources. Um, and then have some, probably have some cash standing by as a kind of buffer for cash flow issues. And then as you go, you can start to gauge what level of profit you're making and can you invest more in your business in terms of buying more stationery, buying more equipment, um, starting to think about branching out into an office if you're working from home. All these sorts of things, very flexible, and they can change uh, quite regularly through your working life as a freelancer. So have a think about what you need and then have a think about what you want and have them as sort of essential and desirable categories. In terms of the main thing that you do on a daily basis almost is record keeping. It's absolutely essential in terms of filing self-assessments and tax and national insurance. Also just keeping track of what work you have coming in and what work you're looking at. Um, so records are 100% important and it's something that if you're generally quite an organised person uh, you'll come naturally to it. If you're not so organised then you need to have a think about putting structures in place um, to, to make sure that you tick all the boxes and you don't find yourself a year down the line not quite sure who you've worked for, how much you've been paid and all that sort of essential information. So in terms of the things that are really important to keep clear records of, the financial side of things, quotes, I think this is probably the most important thing I would say because people will contact you and say how much for you to go do a workshop or how much for you to go and dig for a few weeks on this site or something larger if it's a more complex project. When you're compiling quotes it's important to be as detailed as possible, as clear as possible about what money is going where, what it's all going to cover, is there contingency uh, money in there as well in case things take longer than expected and then once you've given that quote to the client make sure that they've acknowledged that and that way you know that they know what they're getting, you know what you're meant to be providing and then later down the line it can just clear up any issues in case sometimes you do have clients come back and say well I'm not going to pay that, I said it was going to be a couple of thousand pounds and now it's more than a couple of thousand pounds and then you can always refer back to your document and say no as you can see here this is how much I said it would cost and that's what I'm charging for and that way you're kind of covered legally in terms of any disputes. Now that doesn't happen that often, um, I would say in, in my experience, but it is always important just to have those structures in place just in case of a worst case scenario. And invoices as well, that sort of, and receipts, that covers the money going in, money going out of your business, your bank statements. Um, in terms of how you structure it, you can do it through a, per if you're self-employed, you can do all your business transactions through a personal current account if you wanted. But I find it easier to just have a separate current account in your name as your sort of business account. And that means that you basically just have to show the bank statements. Any money you're paid goes into that bank, uh, bank account and then any money that you're spending on things goes out of that bank account. And it means your personal finances don't come into the picture. Otherwise when you're doing your self-assessment and your accounts at the end of the year you have to try and account for everything you've done in terms of personal expenditure as well as all the work expenditure. So it just makes your life a bit more complicated. Um, so, bank statements from your bank account, um, really important. Any correspondence, that sort of comes back to the, the issue of quotes. Just make sure you know what you've promised, what you haven't promised, and the previous discussions on, on um, any project you're doing or any project you might be doing. Um, tax and national insurance details, these are all things that will be posted through to you from the government at various points through the year. Pay slips from any other work you're doing that's not freelance and also P45s, P60s, all the sorts of usual um, documentary evidence you get from doing any work for other companies. Expenses receipts are really important. Um, I'll go into that in a bit more detail, but if you have receipts for things you can claim tax relief back, so just keep a receipt of everything you have, and then chuck the ones you don't need out at the end of the year, but keep everything from the year you've worked, um, and you keep them up to five years, I think, as a self-employed person. Um, so you just have to have hard copies of everything and have everything filed. Well, a mileage log is important if you're doing a lot of travel for work so that you can see when you've travelled and how much. Um, that comes back to tax relief as well. Diaries of activities. I keep a diary just in terms of where I've been every day, have I travelled, was it in my own vehicle, someone else's, what um, sort of expenses have I um, done. Because you can go out to the shop and just buy something and think, I need that for work. You buy it and then you've lost the receipt or you've forgotten you've bought it and when it comes to 12 months later actually remembering all the different things you need to claim tax relief on can be quite um, 
quite hard to do. So I just put everything in a diary, basically, and then I've got that record of everything. And it means as well, if anyone ever needs to question stuff or look back, you've got that from previous years as well. Um, project rock, uh, records and documents, it's really important to keep a, an archive yourself of all the work you've done in case a client does come back to you and say our hard drive got wiped, do you still have all that information? Um, and just for your own sake as well, in, ter in terms of the work I do, a lot of it's quite repetitive, so keep, keep everything and it means you might save some time developing in the future. If you've already got context sheets that you've made up for a dig, you might just be able to reuse that same template in the next project and that goes for pretty much everything. There's always bits you can reuse or take bits from, and it will save development time in the future. So, if you've decided I am going to go freelance, what do you actually need to do? This was something I struggled with quite a lot. The um, HMRC website has lots and lots of information on it, but I wouldn't say it's in the clearest terminology. And quite a lot of the time, when I was trying to find out what do I actually need to do to become self-employed, didn't really have any clear answers. I have to say, and. Um, Things have improved a little bit over the last couple of years, I think, but there's still a level of vagueness to some of the, the information they give out. Um, what I do remember coming away from the website the first time I looked at it was just there was a threat of fines. If you did anything wrong, you were going to be fined lots of money. And I, I was like, well, I don't know how to do it right. How do I do it right and not be fined? So that was really quite a daunting thing for me to actually understand what I needed to do just to become self-employed and therefore not get fined for doing anything incorrectly. Um, so actually, what you have to do is go to the website and click on Register for HMRC Taxes. Um, it's been made a bit more straightforward again in the last couple of years. I think enough people complained eventually, um, or were doing it wrong, and there's kind of been a level of streamlining of the whole process. So you go to the website, you click on Register for HMRC Taxes, and if you just Google that phrase, it should come up with the link to the website. You have to do that within three months of undertaking your first day of self-employed work. Um, so that was the problem I was having, was I was trying to register as self-employed so I could go and be self-employed. As it turned out, I just had to register in retrospect um, that I had done self-employed work and was then registering to pay taxes. And so by registering, what this does is it alerts the government to the fact you're going to be filling in a self-assessment, which then compiles of everything you've done in terms of what tax you're going to need to pay, what money you've been paid in, um, and also with national insurance contributions as well. So you'll then start to get correspondence from the government about um, what you need to do when. And at that stage, it's all actually quite straightforward because you'll just get a letter every couple of months saying this is what you need to go and do. You go and do it and you don't hear anything from them. So once you've actually done the registration process, it's not too complicated. Um, you're given a, a UTR, a unique tax reference number. And this is basically your login details for your online account. Um, you can also do all this through hard copy, but I'm assuming most people here are probably more likely to use the online option. It is much, much easier and you get much more time to do things. Deadlines are slightly different for people doing it through hard copy paper and um, submissions. Um, it's much easier to do online, so it's definitely worth just starting off that way, I'd say. Um, so basically, once you've got this account, you can go in and you can start to look at the different information that you need for a self-assessment. When you come to the end of the financial year, which is at the end of March, you then have the option to actually start filling in the information. Um, you always do it retrospectively, so in March 2014, um, at the end of this month, I'm going to be starting to fill in um, for my self-assessment for the previous tax year. I then have to actually pay my tax the following end of January. Um, so anything that I'm doing in the last couple of months, this month, I'm going to be paying my tax for that the following January. Um, so you submit your self-assessment and you then basically get a bill that says this is the tax you need to pay, this is the national insurance you need to pay. Um, and as I said, the bill, uh, because of the time it takes to process things, the paper copies have to be in October. So by doing it online you get an extra couple of months leeway, not just to fill out your self-assessment but also to get that bill back and then pay it in time. So every paycheck you get, you need to keep money aside. And that was another thing that I wasn't quite sure exactly how much money needed to be kept aside. So to be on the safe side, I completely overestimated them for the first couple of months. I had like very little actual spending money left because I was just quite worried about being able to make sure I had enough to pay for tax and national insurance. Um, so hopefully I can give you a bit of guidance on this. Um, 
tax, national insurance class 4 and national insurance class 2 are the main things you need to consider for every paycheck that you get in. Um, whether you then decide to keep another percentage free in terms of investing back in your business, that's entirely up to yourselves. Um, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail later. But these are the things that you absolutely need to keep money aside for. First is tax. That's a big one. Everyone gets a personal allowance in Britain of £9,440. And this is for the current tax, or, yeah, the current tax year. And that changes each year. It's been increased recently, so by about a thousand pounds from what it was before. Um, so it's worth keeping an eye on that because it will change at least a small amount every year. So that's tax free. Any money you earn up to that amount, you don't have to pay tax on. Um, so then on top of that amount, once you know how much you have in, when you start to get to that sort of threshold, you're then going to need to start keeping about 20% free, um, in, maybe in a different account, maybe just knowing exactly how much you need to keep for paying your tax at the end of the year. 20% um, is a good estimate, but you kind of, you'll probably end up not having to pay the full 20% if you've got tax relief things um, to sort of reduce it a little bit. The benefit of keeping 20% free, even if you know you're not going to have to pay all that, is that you then get a little bonus at the end of the year, which I then use to invest back in the business. Anything that I haven't had to pay in tax and national insurance that I've kept aside, I have used money for investing back in, in terms of buying new equipment or um, getting someone to design a logo for me or something like that. Um, so the tax itself, that gets paid in January of the following year, as I said. Um, and so, for example, this January I paid for 2012-2013. Um, um, and that's why, again, it might be worth having a think about where you put this money when you put it aside, because it's going to sit in your bank account for a whole year. And if you're not completely on top of your finances, you don't want to start eating into that sort of um, pot of money. Um, once you've been self-employed for a year, you do start to pay in advance for uh, tax, because the government try and keep on top of it, so you're not always paying retrospectively. Um, it's an estimated contribution based on your previous year. And what I would say is that it's, for me, it's generally accurate because I have the same, roughly the same amount of work coming in each year. If you have got more work coming in, then you might find that as well as the contribution you've paid towards the next six months, they'll then ask for a bit more later. Um, if, you've, if you've got a situation where you know you're getting a non-freelance job for six months, you don't want to have to pay that tax outright when you know you're not going to have to pay it on any freelance work. So you can then apply for an exemption. Um, if you're generally quite consistent through the years, then it makes that very straightforward. You just pay what you're told, and then you might get a little bit back or have to pay a little bit more, but your money should still be set aside in a pot for that. Um, and so once you've been going for a couple of years, you'll basically be, pay be paying everything in January, and then another contribution for the following six months, and then the next six months you'll get another letter through the door. So once again, once it's up and running, you just basically have to follow the instructions, and as long as you understand why you're paying money and what it's for, um, it's quite straightforward to do. Um, online banking is fine for it as well, in terms of the actual payment, it can just be made online. Uh, if anyone's got their online banking, for me anyway, I just go on and I type in the account number and it immediately comes up with HMRC tax, or HMRC national insurance class 2 contribution to paying what it is you're paying. Um, so it's very, very straightforward to do. Um, there's also money that has to be kept aside for class 4 contributions. These are paid at the same time as your tax, and they're profit related. So if you're going to be earning above a certain threshold, you start paying national insurance on it. Um, if you pay 9% on profits above 7,755, up to 41,450, and then you do pay a further 2% or anything above that sum. And that's something that comes in as part of your bill. So as well as your 20% for tax, keep 9% for any profits above this amount free. And by profit, I just mean the money that's coming into your company. Um, there's also a national insurance class too, which everyone pays as standard. And that's basically a right, so 270 a week. There's a little bit of a discrepancy in the HMRC website at the moment. It says 260 on one page, 270 um, on another, uh, 265 sorry, on another. Basically, I've been paid 265, so I assume that the, there is an increase to 270 um, for the next financial year, but they've not actually updated their website to reflect that. Uh, so 270 is what you want to budget for, about 140 quid in the year. Um, you can pay this monthly in arrears if you just set up a direct debit. 
Um, or you can also just get a bill in April and October and pay it in chunks. So whatever suits you better. Um, if you earn below this, so if you're maybe thinking about just doing a couple of workshops every now and then, you might not have to pay this at all. Um, anything below that amount there means you don't have to pay. So they'll either, either refund it or they'll allow you to apply for an exemption if you know for a fact you're not going to um, earn that much in the year coming. So those are the three things you need to keep money aside for. Class 2, keep 140 quid free for it. Class 4, 9% for any profits. And the tax, 20% as standard. And so that's the money you need to keep aside. And then as I say, anything you then don't have to pay because of tax relief or because um, you haven't earned as much as you thought you would, then that's just a bonus. Um, and you can choose to invest it back in the company or, or yourself in prison. Um, <clears throat> the way of sort of like minimising your tax is to claim against your tax bill. Um, so as well as your personal allowance, which um, everyone has, which means you don't pay tax up to £9,000 roughly, you can also then increase your personal allowance basically by claiming any, anything that's um, capital assets or other expenses against things. Capital assets basically one-off items, so if you bought yourself a total station or a GPS or other equipment, then you can keep the receipts for that and then put that information into the self-assessment form. There's all quite clear headings for this sort of stuff. And then it will calculate, okay, well you spent this much on it, that means you can get a certain percentage of tax less than original. And the same goes for all sorts of work expenses. It's worth having a proper look at the HMRC website for the full list of what you're eligible to claim for. Um, the main stuff, if you have an accountant or any professional fees, um, any professional subscriptions, so if you're a member of the IFA, uh, you can claim that back. I think you can also claim if you're a member of the CPA, um, but I haven't, um, I haven't double checked that. But as well, if you're like in a specific guild or something like that, like a charters, a uh, surveyor, you can claim those subscriptions back to you. And again, there's a huge list of everything that's eligible on the website. Um, in terms of where you work, if you work from home, uh, you can claim back some of your uh, bills and rent and other sort of like expenses based on the percentage of time you work from home. So you can claim everything back. But if you're working there a couple of days a week, you can work out what percentage of your electricity bill, your gas bill, goes on that time being at work. Um, because otherwise, presumably, you'd be working from an office and your house wouldn't have the electricity on to the same extent. So that's something that you can do if you work from home. Equally, if you work from an office um, and you're paying rent on it, you can start to have a, a look there about how much money you can actually claim back on that as well. Travel expenses, if you get trains, buses, places, or mileage if you're driving yourself, um, you can claim that. And that's again why it's important to keep a mileage record because you, you need to basically say how many miles you've driven um, in your vehicle um, over, over the year. And then, they'll, again, there's a calculation that will happen. They'll work out how much that this means your tax percentage goes down from the original 20%. Uh, any consumables, things like stationery, um, or if you've got phone bills or um, internet use, things like that. Insurance, which is quite a big one, because everyone needs insurance um, to, to practice in terms of the types of archaeology work you're doing. Any accommodation of food while you're away on work as well, if you're eating out a lot because of the nature of where you're working, or if you're paying for B&Bs, things like that, keep the receipts for everything like that, and you can claim it back, and again, that will lower that percentage down. Uh, PP, personal protective equipment, anything from steel toe cap boots, high vis anything like that that you need. Um, to practice work safely, it's something you can claim money back. Um, that, this is just a question I get every now and then in terms of that. Basically, if you're self employed and you don't have a turnover of 79000 a year, then you don't have to register for that. So, I imagine for a lot of people that won't be a relevant thing. If you're a company, uh, like for example, Ross Property Archaeology Services, have to register for that because they have so many large post X um, strategies going on at the moment that they they have so much money coming in and out of their account that they do exceed 79,000 turnover. That doesn't mean that's what they're taking home at night to go and spend on things, but because the account sees that level of activity, they have to register for VAT. And that just means they have to put their day rate up to include VAT, um, uh, which is 20%, and it means that clients then are having to claim VAT back if they're eligible to do so. So hopefully it will be relevant for anyone, but it's just a sort of a, a thing out there. The, the, 
HMRC website is a bit vague on it again because it likes to encourage people to register for that. Um, but uh, you actually don't need to unless you're um, at this sort of threshold. So that was a lot of information, lots of numbers. Um, if people want to sort of have a quick recap of it, um, I should have mentioned at the beginning as well, there's a copy of the slides and the, the relevant information in your happier packets, I think. So if you're kind of needing to go back and double check numbers and stuff, hopefully that will be in there. But these are the important ones to remember, really. Um, as I say, the VAT is something that hopefully won't be relevant, but your personal allowance for tax is 9,440, so keep 20% above this threshold for every paycheck you get aside. Keep that amount of money free, 140 quid every year for your national insurance class two, and keep about 9% of whatever you're earning more than that amount um, for further profits. Um, that should mean that you're safe and probably have a little bit of money spare at the end of each year as well. In terms of the deadlines, January, end of January is when you actually have to submit your self-assessment and pay your um, your tax and your class four national insurance contributions. You've got to pay the class two, you need to be that monthly or if you're just getting bills in, it comes in in April and October. And in terms of registering that, this is a really important one. Um, make sure you register within three months of that first day that you've worked as a self-employed person. And then that way you can avoid all the fines that they threaten you with um, on a regular basis on the website. <laughs> so as long as you sort of keep to those deadlines, you should be fine. And everything goes quite smoothly, as I say, once you've been registered and once the stuff starts coming through. The important thing is just to understand why you're being asked to do things in different ways. Um, and there is a lot of detail on the, on the HMRC website in terms of what you can claim for and what you're eligible to do in different situations. So self-assessment can also become a little bit more complicated maybe if you have other work going on. So for me, that would be my Northlight Heritage work, my zero contract work. Uh, or if, for example, someone offered me a, a part-time contract for like a couple of months or a project contract the length of a month where I was on a pay -y basis instead of a freelance basis. You basically need to declare all that in your self-assessment. As you work for these companies, just as you would now, you be getting a pay slip through at the end of each month, presumably, or at the end of each week, depending on how the company pays you. That details what you've been paid, what tax you've already paid, and what national insurance you've already paid. And at the end of the financial year, you get P60, which shows all of this for that company and for other companies that you've worked for. So all that information goes into your self-assessment at the relevant headings, and that way it can then calculate if you've actually already paid a chunk of tax, and um, how much of your personal allowance is left, and how much you might need to get back from other companies. And that will then influence the total that your freelance work asks you to pay to the relevant as well. So it's a lot of work in terms of keeping records and that has to be done regardless of how you do it. If after having had a look at the website, having had a look at the information that the HMRC gave you, you're still not clear and very uncomfortable with the idea, idea of doing self-assessment yourself, you can get an accountant to do it for you. And this is something that can make it quite straightforward. You'd have to hand over all your records, they'd have to be very clear and you might find that sometimes the accountant comes back to you with queries. Um, but all that information would allow them to basically do your self-assessment for you. In terms of how much it costs, it does completely vary depending on who, who you get to do it and how much your business is, um, or how complex your accounts are, how much your business is working. Um, 300 400 pounds ish is a quote I got recently uh, for myself. So it could be less than that if you have less different projects going on, less money coming through, or it could be a lot more than that if you have lots of different complexities to your business, like for example if you own a, a vehicle that is a business vehicle rather than just your own vehicle that you use sometimes for work, um, or if you have a uh, property, if you actually own the office you work in, things like that, that can all make it a bit more complex, at which point you might want to think, I'll just get the accountant to do it, they can do the hard work. Um, it's also useful having an accountant do it for a variety of uh, reasons. HMRC are probably less likely to audit your records, and if they do, they'll be auditing the accountant um, rather than coming to your house and demanding all your records um, because the accountant will have a copy of all your records as well. Um, obviously, if there was then anything suspect, you'd be subject to an investigation. They have to clear up any inconsistencies they've identified. But generally, assuming everything's fine and above board, HMRC are much less likely to, to sort of ask you for lots of details on your records and put you through an audit process if an accountant is signing off on it. 
Um, and this isn't because they're necessarily expecting you deliberately defrauding the government by not paying the right amount of tax or not declaring all your income, but there's an assumption that people will probably make mistakes and do stuff wrong, so it's more like they're more likely to target people not getting an accountant to double check their records. Um, I, I don't get an accountant to do mine um, because they're relatively straightforward and, um, and I've never had any trouble from them or auditing from them, but I know several people who work on a freelance basis who've never been audited in 20 or 30 years of working. So it's not something that's necessarily that likely to happen, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, something that I do sort of struggle with is that some organisations don't always recognise financial stability if you're self-employed. Uh, things like estate agencies getting a mortgage, um, even recently for me trying to rent somewhere through an agency rather than through a private um, sort of deal, um, they asked basically for either pay slips to go back for the last year, um, a, a letter from the company I worked for, or if I was self-employed they wanted three years worth of my account signed off on by an accountant. Um, so basically I decided not to get the flat because I didn't have three years worth of accounts signed off on by an accountant. Uh, and someone else went on named on the lease instead of me and I just sublet from them. So it can complicate things slightly in terms of daily life, um, but it's not necessarily um, something you want to shell out for or five hundred pounds or anything. Um, so quite often you might find it wouldn't be maybe that extreme a situation where you're prevented from doing something by being self-employed, that's quite rare, but you might find you're asked to provide extra proof of income just because people want to know that you can pay for stuff or that you have good credit and things like that. So not something to be too worried about, I wouldn't say, but just something you have to be aware of. Um, so I think we'll take a bit of a break, um, but just while that's all fresh in your minds, are there any questions so far that I can help you with? Or, like that? or have I just killed everyone with too many numbers? <laughs> yeah. If you're just self-employed on your loan, it's below the threshold. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you, you registered before before, you just have to be self-employed and self-employed. Yeah. By the end of the tax year, um, when you have to go to declare, you've got below the threshold. Yeah. You still have to put in forms, don't you, just so you have earnings? Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. And that, they can then confirm, okay, they've only earned £4,000, for example, so therefore they don't have to pay them. Your bill would come back at zero. Um, for sure. that, and they, you could then look at your class two national insurance contributions, which you have to pay um, when they are like basically from self employed start date onwards, you do have to pay the class two ones, which is 140 a year. And so, if you're paying that month by month or paying it in April and October, that kind of comes out of your account. But the minute that they see that you haven't earned enough, you can then apply for a refund, and it, it comes to you relatively quickly. No, I that happens now under the threshold. Um, Year and a half ago now. Okay, yeah. So I was declared in September, October last, last year. Okay, yeah. And they've still taken, they have, I think it was the tax, they've still charged, they still bill me for it. Right. Even with the miles worth of thresholds. Yeah. I'm thinking now, may that have just been the national insurance they've charged, they bill me for It could be, yeah. It should detail that on the, um, the sort of statements that you get through from them. It should detail what the money has actually gone towards. If it did say tax, then it's maybe been a mistake on their part, and it would be definitely worth chasing up. So I did phone call my phone and explain that to can't check this is all sure. the correct thing. Like, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's absolutely correct. I mean, they never ask for any proof of the money or anything. They never yeah. ask for any proof. Yeah. They're just going to take my word, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, they don't, basically. I've never been asked for proof of my expenditure or my income at all. Um, in the last sort of four or five years I've been doing this, they've never actually needed to see those receipts, but that's why you keep them just in case they do at some point decide to do a check. I think the checks are generally done at, at, at random from a pool of people, they'll choose a certain number every year to go and do an audit on. Um, and it can be a pretty sort of painful, uh, painless process or painful process depending on how good your records are. Okay. Um, so if you pay tax and you're under that threshold, I would probably get in touch with them and just double check the details. I mean, it, is, it hasn't come out of the account yet, but they're starting to put charge on this April. Right. So that okay. makes sense that it's national insurance. It's probably right? national insurance then, I would say, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, when you're freelancing a part time job, just to check, mm -hmm. the part time job also contributes towards the uh, tax free threshold. Yeah, yeah. So, um, for example, a lot of the zero hour work I do for Northlight um, doesn't come to a huge amount of money, so Northlight never charged me tax on those pay slips, and that means that my personal allowance has been eaten up by the Northlight work coming in, and then by the time I actually declare my self-employed income, 
most of my personal allowance is gone, so I'm paying tax on almost all of my um, income. It can be the other way around, depending on how your company are charging and um, uh, what their basis for um, working out how much tax you need to pay is. So, for example, say you paid £500 worth of tax already through the year, that's £500 that you, you wouldn't have to pay on um, other income. Um, so, it, the self, because the self-employed stuff is happening retrospectively, it takes account of everything that's happened up to that point. So if you've been over, overtaxed by another company, it should hopefully filter through the system. Inevitably, if things are very, very complicated, it can take a while, so you might be a bit out of pocket for a while till they recognise that you're, you're needing a tax rebate or you get the tax money back. Um, that's generally, it should be done for everyone. As I think there's a three to five year sort of basis. I'll get a letter from the government saying, we owe you a bit of money because we've overtaxed you at some point for one job, like if you've been emergency taxed when you first start at a job. Um, if you don't recognise that and chase it up, the government should be doing checks to make sure if you owe them anything and then if they owe you anything. But you can speed that process up if you know you've been overtaxed on something. You can um, phone up one of the helplines and just ask for the relevant form to fill in to declare that and then they can reassess it for you sooner than they would naturally within the system. Do you know anything about working tax credits and child tax credits and things like that when you're self-employed? Um, not from any personal experience, but there are, I know there are, they are out there um, in terms of child tax credits and things like that. You can definitely get um, your tax adjusted based on whether you're responsible for another, um, another person, whether it's a child or a dependent adult or anything like that. So there, that's something that I don't know a lot about just because I haven't done it myself, um, but the, the first place to look would be the HMRC website, um, and then there's also another link I'm going to at the end, which I find quite useful. Um, when the HMRC stuff's pretty jargon-filled or it doesn't quite make sense, then I go to this other website called startups, um, I think it's startups.co.uk, but it's on the last slide, so that would be another place to, to go and basically search for information on, on that, just to get the details. So maybe take five, ten minutes just for a quick toilet break and come back and then I'll do some more talking. Cheers. Cheers.